Welcome to the Old Guard of Summit. It is my pleasure to welcome back one of our favorite speakers, a man who needs little introduction to many of our Old Guard members, but I will say a few words of introduction for the benefit of our guests who are always welcome to our meetings. Nolan Ash is a 1971 graduate of Columbia University with a major in mathematics and a minor in history. He retired as a casualty actuary in 2012 and has been pursuing his love of history since then. Since retiring, he has been a frequent public speaker, both at the Old Guard and at various libraries and historical societies throughout Northern New Jersey. His concentration is on historical biography, including such illustrious figures as Alexander Hamilton, Winston Churchill, and Abraham Lincoln. In recognition of what he has done, he has been designated an official National Alexander Hamilton Advocate by the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society. Now, this society was one of only three historical consultants to Lin-Manuel Miranda during the six-year project which culminated in the 2015 smash Broadway hit Hamilton. Today, Nolan will tell us about one of the great female figures of the 20th century, Eleanor Roosevelt. And with that, I am turning over the stage to Nolan Ash. Hello? Go. Hello? Go. Hello? Nolan, we hear you. Hey, Nolan. Okay. We're all hooked up properly. That's great. Okay. I, at risk of upstaging myself, I always have references and books that I used, and I forget to tell people what they are because I wait till the end. So if you want to learn more about Eleanor Roosevelt, aside from what you're finding out here, um, <clears throat> there's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book by Doris Kearns Goodwin called uh, No Ordinary Time, which I'll be quoting out of from time to time. Also, easy on the eyes, American Experience has a lot of great programs. American Experience, there's a DVD you can pick up uh, for 19 bucks uh, called Eleanor Roosevelt. There's her own, one of her 19 books, If You Ask Me, which I find very good. And Eleanor Roosevelt's A Personal and Public Life. Uh, those are other things you can find out more about Eleanor Roosevelt from, aside from what you're going to hear right now. But I'm going to get into Eleanor Roosevelt sort of in a roundabout way, if you will. I'm a huge fan of lists. I, I love lists. The American Film Institute, 100 Greatest Movies of All Time. Citizen Kane has been number one from almost my entire life. Casablanca used to be number two. Uh, now The Godfather has been number two for the last 30 or 40 years. And as a classic rock fanatic, of course, every Thanksgiving, 104.3 FM, W. Uh, the hard rock station, Hard Rock, has 1,043 greatest uh, rock songs of all time. I'm constantly irked that Stairway to Heaven's number one. I don't like it. But the reason I'm taking on this detour is we now get to where I wanted to get to. In 1999, the Gallup organization took a poll of the most widely admired people of the 20th century. The most widely admired people of the 20th century. Quite a list. And she was number nine, but I want to let you know the kind of company she's keeping. Number one, Mother Teresa. Number two, Martin Luther King. Number three, JFK. Number four, Albert Einstein. Number five, Helen Keller. Number six, amazingly, FDR. Number seven, Billy Graham. Number eight, Pope John Paul II. Nine is Eleanor Roosevelt. Ten is Winston Churchill. 11 is Ike and 12 is Gandhi. And I wanted to stop at Gandhi because if you're watching Showtime right now, if you have Showtime, they're rebroadcasting the masterpiece movie of Gandhi with Ben Kingsley. So that's something uh, you might want to get your hands, your eyes and ears on. Well, let's talk about Eleanor Roosevelt now. Um, she was a member of both the Roosevelt and Livingston families. Both sides of her family were traced back to well before the American Revolution. Her parents were socialites. Her parents were very rich. Her crowd was known as the Swells, the group of people, the, the prototypical super blue blood wealthy people. 
but she had a very, very tragic childhood. In 1892, when she was eight, her mother died of diphtheria. In 1893, her father, who was a hopeless alcoholic, who was kept in a sanitarium, during one of his fits of delirium, he jumped out of a window and killed himself. She was nine. She was an orphan at the age of nine. Another tragedy happened to her even earlier than that when both her parents were alive. May 19, 1887, she's three years old. They're on the SS Britannic, a massive mid-ocean collision. In panic, they are lowered into a lifeboat and get rescued. At three years of age, she had a lifelong fear of boats and the sea as a result of that. Now, if, just, if things weren't bad enough for poor Eleanor, her brother was also a hopeless alcoholic and she became his de facto mother. Uh, his name was Hall. When Hall entered Groton in 1907, she went with, me as it, went with him excuse me, as a chaperone. When he was at Groton, she wrote him every single day. Now, Eleanor was active in something, a new organization we know about still today called the Junior League. So the Junior League was just getting started. And at a young age, she was teaching dancing and gym in the Lower East Side slums. Began her lifelong ingrained belief and passion for helping the underdog, the underprivileged, for always fighting against every form of discrimination in every possible way. This was to be a constant for her whole life. Now, her maternal grandmother up in uh, Tivoli, up in the Hudson and Dutchess County, was, took her in, and she got the nickname Ugly Duckling. Well, I've seen Eleanor Roosevelt, and, and I didn't think she would win any beauty contests. I'm not trying to be disrespectful here. But in an era when, for women, appearances were everything, they're still so important to women's uh, uh, opinion of women among men and, and in society. Um, she found a way to deal with it. We have a quote from her diary in 1898 at age 14. Quote, no matter how plain a woman may be, if truth and loyalty are stamped upon her face, then all will be attracted to her. She always learned how to overcome adversities that she would face. The next year in 1899, She went to the Allenswood Academy just outside of London. She stayed there from 1899 to 1902. Marie Savustre, a French woman, taught her French, increased her self-esteem, and she was the first time in her life, I think, she was really happy and felt accepted and really loved being at the Allenswood Academy. She did not want to leave Allenswood in, in 1902. She was summoned to come back to New York as every woman in her social circle, quote unquote, came out at a debutante ball at the Waldorf Astoria. She hated it, absolutely hated it. But it was a ritual that every one of the swells and every one of the proper people in high society were required really to do. As an aside, Eleanor was a lifelong Episcopalian, a regular churchgoer, and had a deep faith. She often would speak about spiritual and religious matters in her daily quote unquote, my day columns. And there'll be more about that column a little later here. She met Franklin Delano Roosevelt on a train on her way to Tivoli in 1902. They soon became engaged. Now, FDR was the ultimate mama's boy and Sarah Delano was the mother-in-law from hell. He was such a mama's boy, FDR, this is well known and we need to get a little background here, such a mama's boy that when FDR went to Harvard, Sarah went to Harvard also to stay on campus with her boy. Now, immediately, Sarah Delano took an intense dislike to Eleanor, and she made sure her boy agreed with Mama that he was not going to marry this Eleanor person, and she would put it off for a year. And then, if she still wanted to do it, they would have her approval. During that year, she took him on a Caribbean cruise. She took him on a European cruise. I'm sure she introduced him to every hot babe, every eligible socialite, every cool girl in the world thinking for sure she would get him off of this uh, Eleanor kick. But they did end up getting married, not your usual marriage, March 17, 1905. They had to set the date specifically so Eleanor's cousin, the President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, could give the bride away. Then they went off for a three-month honeymoon in Europe. 
Now get a load of this. You can't make this stuff up. Sarah gave them as a wedding present a New York City townhouse, but it was two New York City townhouses, wall to wall, right next to each other, with the walls knocked down so people can walk from one house to the other all the time. They really were one house. Sarah Delano ran that house for the first 10 years of Eleanor's marriage. <clears throat> a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, quote, our children were more Sarah's than mine. Her son James wrote a tell-all book about the Roosevelts in 1973 after his parents were dead. Sarah often said to the kids, quote, your mother only bore you. I am your mother. Your mother is not your mother. Oh, righty. Hey, little family dynamic going on here. <clears throat> Eleanor disliked sex with FDR, and she disliked sex. <clears throat> and with respect to children, a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, quote, it did not come naturally to me to understand little children or to enjoy them. Nevertheless, she did her duty and produced six children. Anna, the first born in 1906 when she was 22, James in 1907, Franklin in 1909 who died immediately, Elliot in 1910 at age 26, Frank Jr. in 1914, and John in 1916. Now in September 1918, there's more melodrama into Eleanor's life. She finds a large bundle of love letters written from FDR to Lucy Mercer, her social secretary. He'd been having a hot affair with Lucy Mercer long before September 1918. Eleanor being a moralist, wanted to do the moral thing, not the expedient thing, she wanted a divorce. Both Sarah, mother-in-law, and Louis Howe, their lifelong uh, confidant, opposed it seriously. And Sarah made it clear she would disinherit FDR and Eleanor if there was a divorce. From that point on, their union was more of a political partnership than a, a usual marriage. She went back to public life as a social worker. FDR was a rising force in the Democratic Party. Now, this is an interesting side note, and it's really important to emphasize this as much as we may want to deify Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, it's the 100th anniversary of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1920. Although she became uh, an epic advocate for women's rights soon after 1920, it is important to note that she played no part whatsoever in the suffragette movement until after women got the right to vote in 1920 and didn't change until her husband changed his own position. So that's the earlier Eleanor Roosevelt. Now in 1920, FDR ran for VP. Eleanor made her first campaign appearances. They lost badly. In 1921, tragedy is to strike FDR and Eleanor again. On Campobello Island, as you all well know, FDR is paralyzed. Mama Sarah says you should retire, live the life of a wealthy country gentleman. He thought about it, seriously. But Eleanor and Louis Howe said no. And for once, FDR stood up to his mother. And of course, if he hadn't, we would not have the man who became the president of the United States. Immediately, Eleanor starts being FDR's stand-in. She's carefully coached by Louis Howe. Her first political organization is the Women's Trade Organization, WTUL. Their goals, a 48-hour week. That was considered short in those days, I guess. Minimum wage and end to child labor. And of course, this bears repeating, but until his death in 1945, Eleanor regularly stood in for FDR, making appearances and speeches on his behalf and traveling around the world. He's become basically FDR, the head of the New York State Democratic Party, because the, the guy who preceded him, Al Smith, in 1924 was running for president. They campaigned hard for Al Smith in 1924, and of course he lost badly. I'm gonna do the first of several times I'm gonna quote from uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's Pulitzer Prize winning, No Ordinary Time, quote, Knowing that his mother disapproved of his wife's women friends, FDR built Eleanor a fieldstone cottage of her own on the grounds of the Hyde Park estate just before 1927. Though Eleanor stayed at the big house whenever FDR was there, she considered Valkill the only real home she had ever known. And this was to be the only real home she's ever known. If you go to Hyde Park, Valkill is less than a mile away, a nice little cottage in the woods with a little lake. 
And this basically uh, was her favorite place in the world. In 1924, we're not so sure why, but Franklin's firstborn daughter, Anna, and Eleanor became estranged for life. And Anna, FDR was to slap Eleanor several times in several ways, but this is one I'm going to preview for you. Uh, when he became president, uh, Anna was the White House hostess. His daughter was the White House hostess, not his wife, for instance. And in 27, she started Valkyl Industries, a poor factory right on the Valcor grounds. Uh, it was an idealistic experiment, a small factory for poor farmers using traditional crafts and traditional furniture manufacturing. It really never went well. Uh, it was closed in 1938. You're going to hear about a number of idealistic experiments that Eleanor tried, many of which actually did not succeed, but uh, she, she certainly was idealistic for sure. In 1927, she and her friends bought the Todd Hunter School for Girls, a college prep school. She, so, she, she taught history and literature there. The son, Elliot, wrote many highly personal books. One of them was, quote, The Roosevelts of Hyde Park. It was not published until 1973. During the lifetimes of FDR and Eleanor, this was highly private information, and very few people knew any of these details. This would have been shocking and incredible in the day, in the 20s and the 30s. Of course, as you know, the media never, you never saw Franklin Delano Roosevelt in a wheelchair. You never saw that. It was not ever put on the movies or the newsreels. And all this inside information about their sex lives never became well known. Also in the book, Elliot discloses Eleanor's lifelong battle with depression. Of course, we'll start with uh, FDR's fun and games. We start and end with Lucy Mercer. She was a mistress of his well before 1918. She was beautiful. She was in the top social classes. And she was at his deathbed in Georgia in 1945. So he was continuing an affair with Lucy Mercer from before 1918 till his dying day, literally. He was very close to his younger cousin. Was FDR more than a friend and a mentor to his younger cousin? I saw a TV show about this, and they were kind of, it was kind of uh, ambivalent. It was obviously more than just an uncle and, and, and a friend and a buddy, and he spent a lot of time with her. And his secretary, Missy Lahand, there is no doubt at all that she loved FDR. She would die for him. She worshipped him. Whether he reciprocated how much, we don't know. Now we'll get to Eleanor's um, proclivities, which are not so scandalous nowadays, but back then, uh, if this got out, I don't know what would have happened in, in the 1930s. Eleanor was very close to Amelia Earhart, but she was even much, much, much closer to Lorena Hickok, nicknamed Hick. Hick was the White House reporter for the AP. She wrote Hick letters almost every day, often as long as 10 pages. These never got out in the day, but they were in the book in the 70s. Quote, all quotes from Eleanor Roosevelt, quote, I am madly in love with you, unquote. Quote, I want to put my arms around you and kiss you, unquote. Quote, I can't kiss you, so I kiss your picture, good morning and good night, unquote. At the 1933 inaugural for FDR, it was kind of like a, a spy signal, I guess, she, rose, she wore a sapphire ring Hick had given her. Hick quit the AP. There was some controversy. Hick was openly lesbian, but the, the intimate details of their relationship was not public knowledge. Yet, Eleanor was friendly with many lesbian couples. Her mentor in the UK, if you go back to 1899, that she loved, the French woman who kind of gave her the happiest days of her life, was also a lesbian. So let's get off the lesbian kick and let's go back to the timeline to 1928. In 1928, she and FDR fought hard for Al Smith for president and he lost badly to Hoover. The same year, 1928, FDR is elected governor of New York State. And now we'll jump immediately to the main event. First Lady, 1933 to 1945, Eleanor Roosevelt. She changed it forever. By far the most controversial in US history. This is almost unbelievable. And I'm gonna repeat what I'm gonna say because it blew my mind the first three times I realized this. She was the first 
first lady to hold regular press conferences on her own. She did it bi-weekly. She was the first to write a monthly national magazine column. She wrote it every month. She was the first to host a weekly radio show. She did it every week. She was the first to write a syndicated newspaper column, My Day, every day. So for the entire FDR administration, she was writing My Day. She talked about religion I mentioned earlier. Every day, nationally syndicated. She's got a weekly nationally syndicated radio show every week. She's got a monthly magazine column every month, and she has regular press conferences every two weeks. Wow. I mean, no first lady before or since has had that high of a profile. <clears throat> now she always, always, as I said, and I'll repeat this again and again, because it's well worth repeating. Um, she always was a passionate advocate for civil rights, for blacks, for minorities, for any religious group, for any racial group, for any ethnic group, for any downtrodden group. She was always an advocate and a strong advocate. Uh, one interesting little side story we'll tell here, the, the, the bonus army was World War I veterans. They were promised bonuses. During the Hoover administration, the World War I bonus army set up tents all around the White House. Hoover sicked the army and Douglas MacArthur on them and it was an outrage and it was an embarrassment. When they put their tents outside the White House, uh, the leader of the bonus army was famously on newspaper headlines on the front page, quote, Hoover sent the army, FDR sent his wife. It went much better for FDR than it went for Herbert Hoover with the bonus army. Big deal at the time. Uh, she was deeply involved in founding the American Youth Congress in 1935. It was for young people aged 16 to 25. Uh, four years later in 1939, the top leaders were proven to be communists. It was shut down in 1943. Another idealistic uh, initiative that Eleanor Roosevelt was a part of that uh, didn't end up that well. In 1933, uh, another idealistic program that she started right after FDR came in was called Arthur Dale, West Virginia. She wanted an idealistic community for poor mine workers to try and help them better themselves. The miners insisted white Christians only. White Christians only. They created that and they created another one across the street for blacks and Jews. And this also ultimately was not successful. Um, we go to 1940. She is the first woman to speak at a national party convention. This is very important. Everyone I think is familiar with the fact that no president in American history, starting with George Washington ever served more than eight years or two terms, nobody. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was going to try to break that. There was a lot of resistance to it at the time. We, don't, we weren't there and we don't remember exactly how it came down, but it was not a slam dunk that FDR was going to get nominated in 1940 by the Democratic Party. There was a lot of opposition to it. And Eleanor Roosevelt went to the convention, spoke to the convention. We've just seen this year how powerful the wife of a former president uh, can be when you have Michelle Obama speaking at a convention. Uh, evidently, she was, she was a very, very important speaker, very powerful, very emotional. And this was part of the reason why FDR was nominated to a third term and did get elected to a third term. She was way ahead of FDR again about civil rights. A very famous incident. In 1939, Marian Anderson, one of the greatest singers of the age, was denied a concert hall by the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution. A prominent member of the DAR, Eleanor Roosevelt, quit the DAR and arranged to have the concert at the Lincoln Memorial. I even remember watching clips of that in the, in the 50s as a kid. Very, very famous. Now we jump to Pearl Harbor. And of course, she's probably the first person when it was very unpopular to speak out against the Japanese internment camps. She spoke out publicly and loudly against her husband, against the government, against the policy. And her press, oh, more details about her press conferences. We'll go back to that. Uh, she had 348 press conferences. I'll say that again. 348 press conferences over 12 years, average 30 a year. And her press conferences were for women, reporters, 
only, no men allowed. Jobs for women reporters, they were hard to get. Amazing. Uh, in February 1939, she supported the Wagner Rogers Bill. Uh, 20,000 German refugees, mostly Jewish, under the age of 14, were allowed into the United States. It was a long struggle and an uphill fight for Eleanor trying to get people, refugees, out of Nazi Germany. The State Department was very anti Semitic at the time. Breckenridge Long, the man in charge of European immigration to the United States in the State Department, was wildly anti Semitic. And on top of that, the 1924 immigration law, which was the law of the land, was very tight and very strict and had very low quotas officially to allow any immigration from just about anywhere. Nevertheless, her son James writes in his book, quote, her deepest regret at the end of her life is that she had not forced FDR to accept more refugees from the Nazis. Forced? How could she have forced FDR? Obviously, she was all over him. She was in public. I, I don't know. I guess she was, could be driven to feel a little guilty easily. I mean, she has very little to be ashamed of. And in 1940, she started working with a coalition of Unitarians and US Jews called USCOM. She managed to bring more Jewish refugees to the United States. In a dramatic incident on the SS Kwanzaa in Norfolk, Virginia, she got the anti-Semitic State Department to intervene and stop the boat from going back to Germany. This was a one-time deal. This is a good summary taken again from Doris Kearns Goodwin's Pulitzer Prize winning book, No Ordinary Time. Uh, she documents that from 1933 to 1940, about 100,000 Nazi refugees got into the United States. Could have been a lot more, but, but it was the highest by far of any nation in the world for taking in Nazi refugees. For Jewish refugees, the second highest after the USA's 100,000 was Israel. And Israel only took in, only, I don't know if it's only or not, took in 55,000 refugees. So we did take uh, twice as many refugees as Israel did in the 30s. Now we're gonna start talking about World War II and some of the huge, I mean, huge uh, socioeconomic changes of World War II. Um, up to and even after 1940, there was significant social resistance to women, quote unquote, taking men's jobs on the factory floor and other places. We've all seen the posters of Rosie the Riveter. There was huge advertising, propaganda, if you will call it, about women. It's okay for women to get in the workplace. It's okay for women to get to the factory floor. And the first wave of women who got on the factory floor were generally domestics who were used to actually working for a living. The next wave, according to Doris Kearns Goodwin, and I'll believe her, were young high school and college graduates. It soon became accepted as patriotic. And finally, the huge labor shortage created by the massive number of men going into the army had a huge female working force. Here's some more huge demographic shifts in World War II. I lifted this from John Kenneth Galbraith because it's a little hazy, but it'll give you a feel of, of just the, the tectonic shifts that were going on. Uh, before World War II, there were about 1.5 million black farm workers in the South. By 1970, there were 100,000. Most of that shift, probably a million of those people, uh, went from the South to the North during World War II. We know that 6 million blacks and whites migrated from the rural South to the urban North during World War II. Now let's remember the population of the United States then <coughs> was about one fifth of what it is now. So try to think about it this way. Can you imagine a four year period in which um, you had that massive an amount, I'm doing the arithmetic in my head. I should, do, I should know better, I should do better than this. Uh, eight, as if 18 million blacks and whites migrated from the south, rural south to the urban north, 18 million on this population base in a four year period. That's unbelievable. The Sun Belt wasn't that like that, neither anything else. Another huge shift, more than half the ship and plane manufacturing jobs were on the West Coast. The population of the West Coast grew by about a third in four years. World War II transformed the economy. The GNP went from 100 billion to 200 billion. Boy, the numbers were a lot lower in those days. The miners got steady employment for the first time in 20 years. 
the auto workers doubled their income. Millions and millions on welfare were back to work. Many Southern blacks found a more abundant life in the North. Okay, now we'll go to December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor, a day that will live in infamy per her husband. And now we go to another interesting and, and wild and rocky relationship, Eleanor Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. These two hated each other with a passion and for good reason. They couldn't have been more different. Uh, Churchill was a sexist, he was a racist, he was an imperialist, and of course, Eleanor Roosevelt was for equal rights for everybody, discrimination against nobody. She was totally opposed to it. And for personal reasons, we're gonna get into this, it really was not a good relationship. It was a closely kept secret at the time, but both Churchill and Roosevelt were not at all healthy. They both had serious, very serious heart conditions. Pretty well kept secret, but it was really true. And Eleanor knew it very well. FDR was under doctor's orders not to work too hard or get too much stress, if you can believe it. <laughs> but Eleanor usually kept things under pretty good control. It was a regular schedule, things were predictable, peace and quiet were in the White House. But whenever Churchill visited, all hell broke loose every time. Lots of drinking, lots of carousing, lots of partying, lots of late nights. She was expecting one or both of them to keel over and have a coronary while they were there. On January 1, 1942, the three of them were driving through Virginia. Churchill was laying out a vision for a post-World War II world where the British Empire would continue in partnership with the USA. FDR, the usual politician, nodded and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, this was 180 degrees opposed to anything Eleanor stood for on human rights or anything else. But before Yalta, FDR had come to a position favoring independence for India and gradually dismantling the entire British empire. Before they got to Yalta, FDR had come to be totally opposed to Churchill, to Eleanor's side of this discussion. Perhaps Eleanor played a role in this in over the three years, but it was definitely her position long before World War, World War II. It's pretty clear that in this period of time, Churchill had a minor stroke when he was in the White House in, in December 1941. And who knows what happened to FDR in the years leading up to 1945. I think he had several coronary events. Uh, in October 1942, she, she toured the US and England. In 1942, she began getting many letters from black servicemen about segregation. On March 10, 1943, the Army officially desegregated movies and recreational facilities. Progress was slow and gradual. That's how deeply racism was entrenched. At her pushing, they could only desegregate, uh, at this point, movies and recreation facilities. And another thing about Eleanor, I should digress, and it's important to know, she was constantly getting letters with her daily column. People would say, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And she would often go to FDR on behalf of lobbying for this poor guy who's in a wheelchair or this poor person who's dying of cancer. And, and she was nagging him about these individual events at, 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 on a constant daily basis. Her next cause was supporting the formation of a black air force unit the Tuskegee Airmen. There was tremendous opposition to giving blacks an Air Force battalion of their own. The Tuskegee Airmen, the program was started in March 1941. They were a crack unit. They were probably the best, if not one of the best units in the Air Force, but they were not allowed to fly combat missions until 1943. So they were on the runway for a year and a half before they were even allowed to fly. Now I'm again going to segue into stuff that relates to Winston Churchill, and I've given two hours for some of you guys on Winston Churchill, and I'll repeat it again because it bears repeating. Winston Churchill, because of his experiences in World War I, was adamantly opposed to invading France. He adamantly opposed it. When FDR first joined the war after December 7th and said, we're going to invade northern France, and Churchill said, no, we're going to northern Africa. 
And after we did that, FDR said, we're going to invade France. He said, no, we're going to invade Sicily. And after we conquered Sicily, he said, we're going to go to France. He says, no, we're going to go to Italy. He didn't even want to go to D-Day on D-Day. So this was the first big kind of opposition. FDR began to start opposing Churchill, but Churchill still overrode him in going from Sicily to Italy. In August 1943, she toured the South Pacific. She desperately, desperately wanted to go to the penultimate summit meeting at Yalta. One more slap in the face from FDR to Eleanor. His daughter, Anna, would accompany him to see Stalin and Churchill at Yalta and not Eleanor. And of course, immediately, immediately after World War II, she was a vocal, strong advocate for the rights of refugees. Now, by the time of the 1944 Democratic Convention in late 1944, it was painfully obvious to all outsiders that FDR was a very, very sick man. The 1944 VP pick would almost certainly be the next president of the United States before 1948. It's important I should point this out because I've never done a Truman. Um, by the time of the, of, the, of the 44 convention, FDR had made no decision until only five days before the convention, and he said he would not dictate. Uh, the finalists were Harry Truman, Henry Wallace, and Byrne. Henry Wallace was the sitting vice president. Eleanor Roosevelt loved Henry Wallace. She was a great fan of Henry Wallace. He was extremely left wing. He had visited the USSR during World War II and made many favorable comments about Russia and Stalin. And he was often accused, I would say somewhat rightly, of being a socialist or a communist sympathizer. So the party bosses ended up vetoing uh, Henry Wallace to be vice president in 1944 and selected, as you know, it was on the second ballot, not on the first ballot. Harry Truman was selected VP on the second ballot. The rest is history for Harry Truman. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin in the No Ordinary Time, One More Time, sums up the FDR Eleanor team brilliantly. You cannot improve upon this, this woman's ability to write. Quote, she was the more earnest, less devious, less patient, less fun, more uncompromisingly moral. He was the more entertaining and possessed the more trustworthy political talent, the more finely tuned sense of timing, the better feel for the citizenry, the smarter understanding of how to get things done. And of course, in 1945, FDR was dead. And Eleanor Roosevelt was going to live for another 17 years. Harry Truman immediately asked her to be the first U.S. delegate to the United Nations. She was the first chair of the U.N. Commission on Human Rights. She oversaw the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is still hugely important today, a phrase in every language that we call human rights. 48 nations signed it, only 10 did not. Uh, extreme outliers, the Soviet bloc wouldn't do it, Saudi Arabia didn't do it, and one or two other countries didn't do it, but it was almost unanimous. In 1945, she joins the board of the NAACP, always and ever and continuously early and strong and visible champion of civil rights for all minorities, for all religions, for all ethnic groups. And I didn't say this, I think, but I really would be remiss if I didn't. She had the energy of like 10 people. She was always at 120 miles an hour. So while she was at the UN, get a load of this, and this is just a partial itinerary of her travels when she was in the UN. She flew to India. She flew to Israel. She flew to Russia. She flew to Japan. She flew to Turkey. These are separate trips. She flew to Poland. She flew to Thailand. She flew to Switzerland. She sw flew to the Philippines and more I couldn't keep track of. In 1959, she became a lecturer at Brandeis. During the Kennedy administration, she uh, chaired the Presidential Commission on the Status of Woman. Truman named her in 1945, a nickname she had and loved, the First Lady of the World. In 1962, she died of tuberculosis. Now, Eleanor was a prolific writer, not just a daily writer of letters. She wrote 19 books, 
ending with her autobiography in 1961, which she started writing in 1937. Her first book was published in 1932. I'll give you some of what I think are the outstanding ones. In 1938, This Troubled World, the lead up to World War II. In 1940, The Moral Basis of Democracy, talking the US perhaps into getting into World War II. 1942, This is America, we are in World War II. 1950, The UN and Youth, she's in the United Nations. 1954, Ladies of Courage. 1960, you learn by living. She, despite all of her difficulties, she is buried at Hyde Park next to FDR. So there's a quick introduction to Eleanor Roosevelt. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, feel free, raise your blue hand and we'll get to you. Uh, Jim Blinn. And you? Yes, um, great, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I wondered if you had seen the uh, Ken Burns, um, I imagine you have, uh, story on the Roosevelt's. I know he did one, at least one uh, whole uh, two hour segment, I think, on Eleanor. And I wondered what you thought of that. Well, you know, he's the master of, of documentaries. And, 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 and yeah, I, I had seen it. I loved it. I enjoyed it. I guess the phrase I keep using for his work is par excellence. <laughs> you know, it's a tremendous work. And uh, uh, I don't have any specific thing that hits me on the head like a baseball bat. But there was the usual Ken Burns, a ton of information. I hope to emulate him presented in, in an engaging way. He gives you so much information, but you're engaged and you're not bored. And I hadn't seen that particular one in a long time. So, so I, it isn't in the front of my mind of some particular you know, highlight reel that, that comes out of it. But I would highly recommend that to everybody as well, as I did the American Experience one, which I've seen more recently on Eleanor Roosevelt. And you can buy a DVD for 20 bucks. I'm sure you can see the American Experience Eleanor Roosevelt for free by, by wandering around. And I'm sure you can get back to Ken Burns' wonderful uh, uh, documentary as well. Yeah, one, of, one of the things that um, I remember when you were talking about <laughs> Eleanor speaking in 1940 at the convention that Ken pointed out that FDR said he did not, he didn't go, he did not go to that convention and he s sent her instead. Mm -hmm. Which was a brilliant thing to do politically. It was a brilliant thing to do politically. As you remember, until very recently, nobody was supposed to run for president. You were supposed to be dragged into it. And certainly no one would even dare go for a third term. So FDR could not be seen to be seeking this nomination. He could not. That would have been political suicide. So he consciously had this plan of not going, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to run for a third term. You're going to have to beg me to do it. I won't go, but well, I'll send my wife. And of course, as, as Mrs. Obama did, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt knew how to make a presentation and knew how to give a speech and knew how to move a crowd. And yeah, she played, she played a, a pivotal role in his renomination. And again, you gotta remember, that's 1940. We're not in World War II yet. And FDR, the country is 80% opposed to being involved in World War II. You know, America First was big, Henry Ford was big, Charles Lindbergh was big. <laughs> Wendell Wilkie probably would have won the presidency in 1940 if he campaigned on the Republican side as an anti-war isolationist. He refused to do that. It was a close election anyway. So that gives you a lot of color. Yes, that's great, around the importance. Because without her, he never would have even been nominated. Thank you. Thank you. John Groom. Yeah, good, uh, good morning. Thank you so much for your presentation. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was wonderful. Uh, I have a rather technical question for you, if I may, um, it, because I'm a, a student of the history of rock and roll, amongst other things, and clearly the uh, numbers of population movements uh, of blacks moving from, um, from the South to the North during um, the Second World War is of interest to me, and I have never actually discovered any 
reliable sources for that. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, let me know the sources that you gave to us for the, po the population movements that you cited. Yes, yes. Uh, one of them I can do off the top of my head, which is the great Doris Kearns Goodwin Pulitzer Prize winning No Ordinary Time. She has statistics in there. I don't, I have a library and I read some of the books. There are a lot of them. I got it out of John Kenneth Galbraith not surprisingly, a John Kenneth Galbraith tome. I'll find it and I'll make sure it gets to you when I find the other source. Okay. But I had two sources for those statistics. And of course, I'm a classic rock fanatic. Uh, I, you were great on the Beatles and I, I love the Beatles to death and I love rock and roll. And of course, I thought you were gonna get into the blues because I'm Claptonian by religion. That is my actual religious belief is Claptonian. And so the blues really, when all those millions and millions of rural blacks went to the urban north to a freer environment. That is when the blues really exploded in the United States in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. It, it makes obvious sense. You know, before it, it got exported to Liverpool in the 50s, it had to get to Chicago and New York, and it really exploded during World War II. Right. Thank you. A little Thank less you. serious, but... <laughs> Bill Tittle? Yeah, um, I'm struck by the notion of opposites attracting. Uh, but uh, it was more than that, uh, I'm afraid, uh, because, I mean, I'm sure he uh, recognized the value of her views that he really just couldn't relate to. But there was hostility, too, there. I mean, and I never knew that before. I mean, the the notion of uh, she wasn't uh, his hostess and uh, the daughter Anne and so forth. Um, so my, my question is, um, what's your sense? I mean, am I right that, that they attracted each other, but they also repelled each other? I think that's a fair statement. I mean, this is a really complicated relationship uh, in every way you can think of. I think what you have to remember is they respected each other. They always respected each other, even when they hated each other. They both knew they were geniuses, so they respected that. As I like to say, I don't think I'm a snob, but I might be an intellectual snob. So they respected each other. He listened to her. He valued her counsel. He usually discounted it. Uh, she obviously admired him and admired his brilliance. And she wanted to move the country very quickly to the left. And FDR realized that you could only move slowly and gradually with fits and starts to get to the promised land that Eleanor Roosevelt saw. And FDR leaned that way, but he was a master politician. And so he was saying, you know, I'm going to get you there, you know, but, but we can only go so much, one step at a time. And yeah. uh, I, I could go on and on, but um, it was a complex relation. And of course, in public, again, I got to emphasize this. If, if this was happening today, you'd know FDR was in a wheelchair. You'd know FDR was paralyzed. You'd know Eleanor Roosevelt was a lesbian. These are things that were, they made sure, they didn't want anybody in the public to know these things. Neither one of them wanted it known. So they obviously made a pact, you know, an alliance, if you will, a shared values, mutual respect, mutual brilliance. Uh, I guess that's my best stab at it. Thanks. Mitch? Yeah, hey, Nolan, uh, I got a little confused uh, when you talked about right after World War II and the diaspora and everybody moving around and you said Nazi rev uh, refugees. You meant refugees from the Nazis, I assume. Yes, yeah, yes. Just Sometimes, go back through uh, that and, and kind of tell us all a little bit more about, uh, you know, the, the Eleanor's uh, role in, in, in the uh, diaspora. Well, I, I talked a bit about the 30s uh, when it was very hard to get uh, refugees out of Nazi Germany to the United States. Uh, the State Park Department was overtly anti-Semitic. Uh, Breckenridge Long, who was in charge of European immigration into the United States, was obscenely anti-Semitic. So it was very hard to get the U.S. to accept uh, refugees from Nazi Germany, particularly Jews. And I, I got a lot of it on the tape that went through a number of ways. He formed a committee with Unitarians that got 20,000 refugees out under the age of 14. 
um, by hook or by cork in different ways, the United States accepted about 100,000, again, per Doris Korn's Goodwin book, uh, 100,000 uh, refugees. The second highest country in the world was Israel. And they right. accepted 50,000 uh, uh, Jewish refugees in the 30s. So we accepted twice as much as any other nation. And of course, we could have done a lot more. She felt horrible about it. She wanted to do much more, but that was all that could be done. Thank Is that you. okay? Yep. Clarence, unmute yourself, please. Yes, uh, Clarence here. Great. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. You can't see me, but can you hear me? That good. Um, I was wondering um, on this this question of um, uh, the, the Churchill um, and uh, his reluctance to um, to invade uh, France. Did you stumble upon, or have you any um, uh, find any disclosures? As to the reasons why he, uh, or reason why he was so reluctant to um, to invade France. God bless you. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> I gave uh, I, some of the old guard boys have been watching me for six or eight years. I gave two hours on Winston Churchill, and I mm. had to give two hours because I didn't realize he was 66 years old in 1940, and he had already lived five lifetimes. Indeed. Uh, yeah. The, 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 uh, the apocalypse, the absolute horror of trench warfare in northern France in 1914, a million people died in the trenches in 90 days in 1914 mm. for no reason to gain no ground. Churchill was so furious about it that he championed uh, what was called the southern strategy, which is sail into the Mediterranean, come around the back of Turkey and go into the Gallipoli Peninsula. They had a whole campaign to try and get out of, of, of the death trap in northern France and invade through Gallipoli. It failed. He took responsibility. It destroyed his career. And furthermore, getting into it more deeply, Churchill hated communism. He sent an <clears> army <throat> into Russia in 1918 to try and put down the Bolsheviks. He hated Adolf Hitler. He hated Nazis. He hated Germany and Russia. Nothing he liked better in World War II to watch them kill each other by the millions while he stayed at home and watched it for as long as possible. So that's why he never wanted to go back into Northern France until as late as June, 1944. And he didn't even want to do it then. It was, it was a brilliant masterstroke of geopolitical uh, world empire building. And uh, he, he, you know there were roughly 26 million Russians that were killed in World War II and roughly 9 million Germans. Nobody else was even close to that. And, and Churchill was just very happy to let that go on instead of creating the second front in, in Western, in France, in Normandy. So yes, I've researched that very deeply. I can dig up my, my notes on Churchill. I've got a lot of them. Um, it's very clear. I mean, he didn't take out an ad in the media, but it's very clear what his motives were and why he felt so strongly the way he did. Good, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Well, thank you. Mm. Can I make a quick comment here? Um, uh, Nolan, we were talking yesterday, you and I, about the, uh, the CD of your, uh, the recording of your two talks. If, if we can dig those up, I will turn them into two YouTubes and we'll add them to our collection. Okay, agreed. I've got a bunch of them lying around, yeah. Yeah, well, those two were really good. I remember them, so that's worth putting up, definitely. Okay, I guess the others were no good. No, I'm just kidding. Now, the <laughs> others are great too, but those are relevant now. <laughs> yes, okay. Steve okay. Arley, your question? Uh, Nolan, uh, great job as usual. Uh, you spoke about uh, Hoover using the military uh, to uh, dismantle the uh, Veterans Bonus Army. Uh, and just as a footnote to that, uh, the military raid was actually uh, led by the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, a fellow named Douglas MacArthur. And he had a couple of famous folks working for him. Um, his aide was uh, a major named uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and the 3rd Cavalry, which actually did most of the damage uh, when they were dismantling the Hoovervilles, was a fellow named Georgie Patton. And I guess my question is, knowing what you know about FDR, apparently uh, he never held, held a grudge against those fellows because their military career certainly uh, 
blossomed in the next few decades? Yeah, um, well, I could go along. To, as usual, a great question with a lot of detailed knowledge. Steve, you're on target for all three of those people. Um, you know, MacArthur always had a God complex. He called Dwight Eisenhower the best clerk I ever had. He was his clerk at West Point. Um, MacArthur definitely wanted to be a uh, president or God or emperor. And uh, yeah, uh, he had issues with FDR and, and, and they, they went back and forth at each other over time. And of course it finally escalated uh, in the Korean War when uh, uh, this little kid, Harry Truman, who was he? You know, he was not gonna stop him from fighting the Korean War the way he wanted to. And of course Truman fired him to show he was commander in chief. Um, and FDR, um, to go into another subject, I gotta bring up since I lived in Nolens, Louisiana for three years. Um, in 1935, when they were talking about even him running for a second term in 1936, uh, the biggest threat to FDR was the kingfish, Huey Long, in 1935, before he was assassinated in 1935. But FDR said the other big threat is Douglas MacArthur. He knew Douglas MacArthur's blind ambition way back from the bonus march and from 1936. I've been scattershot, but uh, hopefully that's somewhat, we, we can follow it up more later. That's great, thank you. Rick, you have done you. Am I on? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, just wonderful talk again. Great facts, great information. You never disappoint. Uh, I think a lot of reactions uh, to Eleanor's, uh, you know, uh, request were related to FDR's being such a political animal. He was so worried and paranoid about getting elected, even though he got elected four times, he was always worried, worried about the South, uh, worried about bombing uh, uh, the trains going to the concentration camps. He could have done a lot more except for his, uh, his political anxieties. Uh, and just a footnote, when we were at the uh, uh, museum, the uh, library, the FDR library, there's a big portion set aside for Henry Wallace, a collection of, uh, of all his materials and so forth. I gather he came from a wealthy family in the Midwest and they uh, put together a, a very interesting thing. Uh, he dumped Wallace uh, because he was worried about politics and he was an unpopular man with some of the with some of the party. Again, thanks again, Nolan. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and that's a great idea, everybody. It's only about 40 miles up to Hyde Park. I've been there three or four times. They have an annual book fair, which may have been COVIDed out, but I would encourage any and all to go up there to Hyde Park, to the FDR library, and Eleanor's Valkill, which is just a mile away. It's not, it's not, it's a day trip. Papa, you're next. Uh, my question is that history is relevant to today's situation. How, how does it relate to today's situation? That's your question? Yeah. yeah. Well, as anybody who knows me knows, I've spoken over a hundred times on many places, on many subjects. I never talk about current events. <laughs> never. <laughs> I did once. I did once and I regretted it. So I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, hopefully we can learn from history. I, 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 I don't see any, I made the mistake of, of, of talking about Obama's wife, which I guess was a mistake, but, but she was a president's wife, Eleanor, who was very, very powerful and influential as well. Okay, Rich? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, what Eleanor's relationship was with the uh, Democratic Party powers that be, uh, especially after uh, Franklin's death, uh, did she get support from them? Uh, did, did she talk with them? Was, was she 
ignoring the, the Democratic Party as she went about her, her various causes. Uh, if you can fill anything in there, that would be great. Great question. Uh, she was embraced by the Democratic Party. Harry Truman immediately appointed her the first ambassador of the U.S. to the United Nations. Um, she served there. As I mentioned, just before she died, John F. Kennedy appointed her to a committee, a commission on women in the early 60s. <clears throat> and of course, the Democratic Party then, as well as now, had wings. She certainly was on the liberal leftist wing of the Democratic Party. There always were especially back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the solid South, the segregationist Democratic South, which was conservative, which was uh, quite a bit racist. They were under the same tent as the Democratic Party. So she was accepted by the Democratic establishment. She was loved by, by the liberal side of the Democratic Party and probably not loved so much by the, by the conservative party. But she was invited. She went to the conventions. She was welcome. I used to see her on Meet the Press she was all over the media. She was a very accepted, known liberal spokesperson. When I was a kid in the 50s, I used to watch her on TV, uh, on the news shows. She was very well accepted by the Democratic Party in large letters. Thank you. Ron? Ron, you're up. Who is, uh, who is it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is Ron Hope. Are you calling on me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Thanks again, Nolan. It was an excellent talk, an excellent talk. Uh, it just happens that my comments are somewhat similar and build on what you just said. Uh, I grew up during the Depression and the World War II years, and I remember some of these things personally. Uh, I, I remember especially that Eleanor Roosevelt in many cases was very unpopular and bitterly opposed by other Democrats for her positions on human rights. And she did this despite the fact that she was opposed not only by conservatives, but by other liberals you know, of her own political party. True, true. Very true, especially, I mean, I'm younger, but if you were to go the farther back in time you would go, let's say back to the 30s rather than the 40s, she was seen as even more an extremist. Even in the 40s, she was seen as a very, very extreme liberal slash leftist. Um, and, and for that point in time, she was an outlier. And, and I think she was uh, disliked, opposed, hated by significant portions of the Democratic Party. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have, an, we have a hand from the audience, Noreen Donovan, a visitor. Hello, Noreen. Hi, great presentation, thank you so much. And John Groom, great rock and roll presentation a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up on all these. But uh, I had understood late in life, uh, Eleanor had a relationship with a man uh, when she was living in New York. I was I was not aware of that. It oh, certainly I didn't, didn't get a lot of attention. Um, of course, she had relationships with uh, FDR, and she had six kids with him. So, so she was not. She easily was bisexual. So it wouldn't surprise me or shock me. I mean, uh, I don't know. I was just asking. I, I don't know anything about it. I'm always anxious to learn something. Um, you know, I had never heard of that. I'd never heard of that. One of the TV shows. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to run it down, but I, I, I've never heard of that. I think he was the doctor. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Dick Garber, one more, another question? Yeah, I think she had a, you know, a, a, I wouldn't say a physical relationship, but a close relationship with one of the writers that, uh, uh, that she got very much involved with. Uh, what I wanted to know, maybe her, uh, close relationship and respect for Adlai Stevenson. Uh, she pushed him a lot and maybe oh, yes. she used the party a little bit. Oh yes, very excellent <coughs> point. Really piles on to the point of was she accepted by the Democratic Party? Well, if you were an Adlai Stevenson Democrat, if you were a JFK Democrat, if you were a Harry Truman de Democrat, yes, she loved you and you loved them. Yes, she pushed Adlai Stevenson and helped him get the nomination. 
And of course, a lot of practical people in the Democratic Party probably correctly said, we shouldn't nominate Adlai Stevenson, he's too liberal and he'll lose. And of course, he did, twice. But Eleanor was very much, uh, very much an Adlai Stevenson fan and very much in his camp and very much helpful in him getting the nomination of a Democratic Party in 1952 and 1956. That actually shows a chain of unspoken acceptance of Eleanor in the Democratic Party from the day FDR died to the day she died. It was all there, just the left leaning wing of the Democratic Party. Miguel? Uh, you're muted. Am I muted or unmuted? Oh, no, you're fine. Okay. I just need to ask the question so no one knows I'm here. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, some people have noted that they had six children. I'd like to remind everybody that there wasn't any television in those days. But in any case, uh, Nolan, I have a challenge for you. Something you said, some things you have said started me thinking. And you mentioned the migration of the uh, blacks from the south up to the north and the Midwest, et cetera, in the millions and uh, how that affected the population. My, my, my question or my request to you is maybe you can take a look at how the U.S. was constructed between 1900 to 1950 or 60, and the uh, migration patterns that came in from Europe, uh, the the Russians coming in uh, after the Bolsheviks and after World War One, the Southerners moving up, the creation of Harlem, the Dust Bowls in the 30s making everybody go to California. I mean, that would be something that I mean, the migration was a significant percentage of the population that you mentioned. I mean, it's a measurable number. We had what, 200 million people in those days? 120. 100, okay, so that's what? 120, that was all. So that's, that's like a, yeah. a, a couple of percent of the population was moving yeah. up, moving out, and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. changing the face of the, uh, of, uh, of the country, which is what brought about the requirements for integration, because you couldn't, uh, you couldn't send them out to, to fight in World War II and then have them go back to the uh, segregation when they got home. Um, I'd like you to take a look at that. Maybe you can put something together. That would be, I would find that fascinating. Okay, I'll consider that. You want me to put a talk together about migration in the USA? Yeah, from, yeah I, you can, you know, you can, you can start with uh, Hamilton who came in from St. Kitts, but I'm... <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think the period from 1900 to, the, let's say, 1960 um, is, is something that really uh, changed the face of the country. And some of the patterns, like you mentioned, the yep. anti-Semitism in 1930s and, and you know, uh, Birth of a Nation in, the 19, in Woodrow Wilson, mm -hmm. all those influences that mm -hmm. uh, came about would mm -hmm. be uh, interesting for... Uh, I think you're qualified. You're 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 probably capable of drawing us a picture of what would, what was going on. Okay, I'll think about it. You you spurred my one of the synapses in my brain to click, saying America has always been the nation of people that were on the move, starting from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast and manifest destiny. Remember the Sun Belt, Miguel? I'm a baby boomer. Where did I go in 1980? Arizona. Population yep. migration has been a constant of America a constant theme and a constant theme of the land of opportunity. If you fail here once, you can go somewhere else, or if you want to do better, you can move, you know, and Americans have been doing that. Yep. I mean, there was no Vegas in 1945, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, okay, Rich, you want to summarize? Before you do that, everybody, can I say one thing? I'm going, we're going to unmute everybody so we can do our closing ceremony but we need you all to stop talking to the people sitting next to you and making other loud sounds just for a minute while we finish this. Well, Nolan, you did it again. It was great. I, I personally have a understanding now of Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt, her times and what she did and what she accomplished and the way 
the way she viewed the world and the way the way part of the world uh, viewed her as well and then the fact that uh, there are suggestions for additional presentations as a testament to what a great job you did today again at this point as as you know uh, we we have a couple of ways of thanking you for doing such a great job and being here to inform, educate, and entertain us. Uh, one is the Orchid Certificate of Education. <laughs> and there it is. Yep. <laughs> as you know, uh, but maybe, maybe some of our guests do not know, there's a beautiful orchid on the certificate which recognizes that uh, orchid is the emblem of the Summit Old Guard because in 1930, when the Old Guard was founded, uh, Summit was an orchid growing and distribution capital of the United States. And so this certificate of appreciation uh, uh, is for you, you and thanks. So, the thank you. The way we have, as you know, know, thank you is the Old Guard salute. And if everybody would join me in standing, if you can, and applauding. Uh -huh. No, that doesn't work. <laughs>